It is time to engage. Here we are talking about the mid-season finale of Star Trek Discovery, Into the Forest I Go, and Episode 9 as well, of the Orville, Cupid's Dagger. Mm -hmm. So, this is an interesting thing. There's just about as many episodes of the Orville in their first season as there are of Discovery in their first season. And yet, for reasons one can only assume are CBS All Access memberships and subscriptions, Star Trek has decided to divide their half season into two, like, quarter seasons. So this is the last episode that we're going to be talking about the Orville and Discovery together. From here on out, it's Discovery or Orville. So we're going to get into that a little bit later. Today we have a very exciting pairing because Heath and Kat are married and have been on the show separately before. But now together, we have this first, like, couples... How did you do? How yeah. did you do? What Face did you off! Think? And did you guys like straight up watch these shows separately from one another? Uh, yeah, Orville we watched separately, and then Dis start yeah, and Discovery, Discovery we watched together due to time constraints. Not just only. to make sure that you like didn't give each other like oh, any I've, idea. I did not have any icon. She was icon. crushing my hand, and I'm like, really? <laughs> I have to say it because I shall crush her him. Oh I no, I'm crush did. her! Look I at did, that. I did. I did. I, did. I, like it. I had to. But no, Picard, your Picard, your time. Picard, your time. Picard, your time. Nice. So, Gosh. let's get in to the Orville first, because a mid-season finale is a big deal, so let's talk the Orville off the top. Um, we got to see an interesting choice of how to discuss sexual consent. Uh, we got to see an episode that was also dealing with Concepts we've seen in original series, um, a, a very, now. a very naked now, yeah, a very, very journey, so. and and like naked now, naked time, plus the journey to Babel, like all together. And at first, as we were going into it, I was like, okay, I can get into all these themes coming together. Um, but Kat, what what did you think about the themes in this episode of the Orville and how they were dealt with? <sighs> well, yeah, Kat. listen. Listen, oh, look you. At the, look at the trash talking. Gosh. Yeah. Um, it was... Uh, okay. You know I love the Orville. This, for some reason, was... N it, I got my laughs in. It wasn't my favorite episode. I wish they would have picked some other way to end for me on this, in, in terms of, like, the mid-season. But it was, it was, it was funny. Um... Rob Lowe was amusing. Yeah. I thought there, there were some interesting sort of full circle aspects of it. You know, the whole, like, who's chasing whom, sort of very Midsummer Night's Dreamy, mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I was kind of, um, it was it just felt a little bit juvenile to me. And I uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know why. I really, really, really wanted to like it. I was also watching it with a seven-year-old. <laughs> also fair. And the interesting thing is there is a Family Guy episode that uses this beat almost verbatim where um, basically both of the Griffins fall in love with Bill Clinton. That's oh, right. Yeah, that's right. Now, yes. they play that one more for laughs and only laughs, whereas in this, um, it was essentially to excuse Kelly from infidelity. Right. And I felt like it really took away any agency Kelly had to say, you know, this is a thing I'm doing because I'm feeling not a part of this marriage anymore. Right, it invalidated a conscious decision yeah. that she made to pursue her own happiness and fulfillment because her marriage wasn't working and and, and kind of made her, tried to make her blameless. But then, <laughs> but then the other really weird thing I found was that, you know, as they became ridiculously obsessed with... Yeah. Um, with Dar, yeah. Dar, um, he, it, 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 you know... It took away from, obviously, their negotiations. And at the end, what I thought was really funny was that I thought at least it would resolve with them coming to their senses and then, like, using, you know, their version, I guess, of the prime directive to kind of make everything okay. Mm -hmm. But no, because they just took some of that sex pheromone and smooshed it on the other aliens and uh, made them fall in love with each other. So that kind of violated everything. And I was sort of like, what? Well, what, I mean, really? I feel what? like the Prime Directive manages to be skirted on something like this. A, because it's the Orville, but B, because these are all warp-capable civilizations at war with one another. I think... Should have known that, Kat. 
<laughs> I think faking them Just... into a temporary peace and then being able to say, oh, you had a shared ancestor. I mean, it, it's all very much B storyline in yeah, because well, the romance was, was the A story. Yeah. Keith, what did you think about the themes on this? I enjoyed this one, but given the, the previous Orville episodes that had come before, I felt that this one was... It, like you said, it was. I felt very Family Guy to me. It, it felt like they were upping the comedy a little bit of it. Uh, I really enjoyed Rob Lowe. Yeah. And it, it just felt like or a fun episode. Rob um, Blow. <laughs> Rob Blue. Rob Blue. Blue. <laughs> Actually, I was interested. Did anyone go back and see if it was Rob Lowe? On it, the was. First? it was. It was. It was. It was. Yeah. Wow. Without a single line in the in the pilot, <laughs> but it's great that they brought him back for this. And they like beat for beat did that ridiculous yes. like squirty which thing, good. which I guess I mean cats keep their pheromones there. Maybe that is like a pheromone ejector. A glandular thing. <laughs> right. A gland. I don't know. Yeah. Or as we said, you know, did he just barf all over the bed? Which I love. <laughs> a nice yes. eye barf. Yes, yes, honey. Did. Yes, he did. Let's call it that. He eye barfed. Yeah. Now, I, I enjoyed it. it. It was a fun episode. I wouldn't say it was necessarily my favorite, given that the last two episodes were so strong for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that yeah. this one was just, this was fun. But I figured it was going to be fun the way they opened it on karaoke, which yes. I thought yeah. was just yes. a great And if we opening. never get to see Bordis sing My Heart Will oh Go On, I will be heartbroken. <laughs> We need to see yeah. that. Here's the thing with this one for me. I felt that there were a lot of unre- unresolved little storylines that yep. I wanted to see resolved. Not just that with him singing, but with him and his um, significant other. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to see a little bit more of what that, how that scenario impacted their relationship. And same thing with like you were mentioning this before. Mm-hmm. Although you know he. Oh, now you're going to take credit for it. Yeah, I sure Fine, am. I totally am. But no, just the the what happens with what happens with uh, I want to say slime. The dog. And snot yeah. monster. <laughs> snot monster. Yeah. Let's call him Snot no, Monster. Yaffet. Yaffet. Yaff, 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 yes. Okay. So what happens when she's holding him hostage, basically at the end? Yeah, she's got the gun on him. Like, yeah. She's threatening him. Is that supposed to? And be... then you, it's they never funny? go back to it to see like how, how that resolves. Yeah. Right. And... Yeah. I mean, what they did with Claire in this episode, I thought, was a real uh, betrayal of how great her character was evolved last week. Right. It was really strange it was to like see Tasha her. Yara gone wrong. Yeah, and you know they get the sort of the get out of jail free of oh it's just like a naked now kind of madness thing, but because it's just localized to these three characters that you see it happen to, mm-hmm. and the fact that well I guess four if you count Yafit, but he just always looks like a ball of snot. You can never really tell performance right. from McDonald in that right. way. Yeah. Um, but it really felt like. It really felt like it undermined how great her characterization was last week. To turn her into, like, the psychotic ex, um, I just didn't dig it. Yeah. It's also when you only have three female characters on a show, and one of them is already involved well, in it. You're like, yeah. you're left no, with the I other mean, two, and it's like, okay. Alara figured everything out. I mean, she was awesome. She, she was strong. It wasn't, I, I you know, I don't... I just felt like it was. I felt like they were trying to accomplish too much, and it kind of bit them in the butt with um, with the doctor. It's like, sure, you know, she's she's super strong. She's <laughs> a mom by choice. She's an incredible doctor. She knows everything, and she's sexy. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's it was kind a of lot like, to squeeze into one character. Yeah. And I mean, ultimately, the fact that um, Malloy and Alara managed to put it all together mm-hmm. between their confidant conversations with Kelly. And with um, with Seth MacFarlane, yeah. um, it wound up being something where that conversation that you want to have happen happened before it got um, frustrating for right. the viewer. Which yes. that was like the one the element of it. It was kind of a little that, off, right? Well, it's funny. It felt like that happened earlier than I would have expected, but it also allowed me to feel like it wasn't giving me a convention. Because that convention of waiting for that conversation to happen that never happens, or like the no, don't go that way conversation right. you have with the screen, I didn't have it. Because those two characters, as, as soon as they had the information, they were smart enough to share it. And that worked out nicely. You know, the thing that, t- that bothered me a little bit too, though, was, was if you have, or if you're exposed to pheromone, you're still yourself. You know, but the fact that they became so unlike themselves yeah. and became like random parodies of 21st century people kind of made me go, what? Like, it took it's me funny. out of it. Like, I'm going to order a Chardonnay now and I'm going to, you know, and it's not like, I mean, obviously, Ed Merger's character still, I mean, he was, he was. She likes red wine. <laughs> 
but no, but my, my point is that he, he, he also, you know, took on these random, like, female parody qualities. Do you know what I mean? And it yeah. kind of felt me, it was just like, no, be you still. Be you and, and be, be the captain and be in love with him instead of, you know, that a 17 sense. year old girl. Uh, computer. Hi, uh, Vanya is joining us. Vanya, hey! And she's saying that she's super annoyed with uh, what they did with Claire. She, yes. uh, she yes. wished that she had figured out what was happening. She thinks that would have redeemed it. Yeah, I mean, I agree, Vanya. They were in that kind of naked, I'm going to say naked time, because in the naked time, <laughs> naked it felt time. a bit more, like, absurd. In the naked now, I feel like the acting was more grounded because it had been, you know... 25 years mm-hmm. since uh, theatrical acting on television was what you did. And so th- the Naked Now gave us more um, grounded characterization with them just being a, a carefree version of themselves. And I totally agree that Claire was just a different person. Right. And, yeah. and, a, and a, a, a psychotic person at moments. Yeah. And, a, and it just, it really, I feel, betrayed the character. It was cool that we got to see... Um, technically, the Orville deal with same-sex relationships um, in a room where, like, the lovemaking had happened or was about to happen before Star Trek Discovery did, because yeah. Star Discovery certainly telegraphed that there was uh, there was uh, you know this couple that they were advertising heavily first same-sex couple on Star Trek. Oh, it's going to be a big deal, and it took until this episode for them to actually kiss. So can we talk about how Culbert and Stamets finally fulfill that sort of infinite diversity and infinite combinations that Gene Roddenberry always put forward? Heath, what did you think of, of getting to see that relationship pay off in, in Discovery? I just thought it was a lovely kiss. You know, I will fully say that uh, 2017, having seen so many television shows with men, women kissing and... I, maybe that's one of the things about Star Trek Discovery is there's some episodes that feel like Star Trek and there's some episodes that just feel like a sci-fi show. Mm-hmm. And just to see the two of them kiss, I was like, hey, cool. Yep, there right it is. On. And then it was like, they're in love, great kiss. He's going to go in and do this extremely taxing, like, hundred, what, like 133, oh my God. 133 yeah, jumps. And it was just like, it was it was just a beautiful moment. And it was like, cool. I, I actually thought the saying, I love you, and putting the hand up Oh my god, it's me. But that was more that was more for me than than the kiss, but the kiss was beautiful. I loved the I, I thought it was just very passionate, so natural. See, I, got, I don't I, think, I, I didn't feel Kirk like there was Spock any thing from Con to like with, with, like in the booth. And, yeah, yeah. Totally, man. And, like I, yeah. I, I, I felt that as well. There were a lot of really interesting kind of throwbacks to different like so many points of reference. Strangely, like the spore jumps, but uh, <laughs> but there were so many aspects of of discovery that that really like you know kind of got me this week, and um, and Orville again it was like um, okay yeah two naked guys hanging out together but and I'm glad and, and it's like wow you, they they took mm-hmm. it really far but it, yeah. again because it felt like a parody, although I gotta say it didn't feel like a parody it just felt like a comedic. Same sex right. love comedic, scene moment. Comedic loves, it it yeah. didn't feel like they were making fun of same sex relationships. Oh no 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 no! And no, I enjoyed that. that there wasn't that like, there's like a homophobia. I'm always afraid Seth MacFarlane is going to go for, and I don't know if this is grounded in something I've ever seen him do, or maybe it's just because I associate like childish goofy humor with <laughs> that's gay, and so I'm like waiting for Seth MacFarlane to do the disrespectful thing, and it never happens, and and. At least on this show, it never happens. I think right. well, he's. I think he's taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah in, he in is. a way, because he can do so much with Family American Dad and all that, because it's animation. And there's the precedent, like what he kind of built it on, because you're going back to a show that started in the '90s. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of built on that, and it's grown. But this one, he's like, look, it's the future. You know, things are so much different. I imagine that's what changeling sex look like because when I saw right saw yeah that I was like hey that must have been like Kira Norris and Odo yeah right I suppose uh, computer um, so we have uh, several people commenting okay. on how they felt about that relationship and that development on the Orville 
Um, but uh, my favorite comment is uh, Ben Stacy saying, despite any flaws with the episode of the Orville, at least the elevator now has music. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the elevator music game. Yeah. Ben, that was that was pretty funny. That weird that sea line thing happening with the guy the with dude. the crazy egghead. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's one of McFarland's people because yeah. I recognize his voice. Yeah, from, yeah, from very Family much guy. so. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty entertaining. I enjoyed that little that little through line as well. It was really cute. And I feel like the Orville is doing a pretty good job for a for a very episodic show. They're doing a good job of having within the episode little through lines, but also across the series because you know Bordis was eating his feelings. Bordis's uh, husband was eating his feelings. And we got to see Clyden having sort of the result of theoretically months of eating his feelings at this point mm -hmm. because he's been gaining weight. And it's like a tiny little thing. And you're right. We didn't get to see that conversation about Bordas and Clyden's relationship pay off in this episode. But I feel like it's one of those things that's just it's a breadcrumb. Right? We have to wait. Yeah. It's moving in its own we way. We have to wait. And the great thing about the Orville is we're not getting a mid-season break with them. So we will get to watch the next you know, four episodes now to see where they're going to take this and see if the plan was to give us a cliffhanger like Battlestar Galactica at the end of season one or if it's just going to be a uh, wait for next year. There'll be more great stuff like this. Computer? Uh, Derek didn't love this episode of the Orville and he, he thinks the relationship between uh, Stamets and the Doctor felt more natural than the one in the Orville. Yes. Very much so. Totally Very agree. Much so. It, it felt so natural to me. And... and <sighs> And you know, I had that feeling when Stamets was saying, one more jump, just one more jump. I was like, no, <laughs> That's not gonna go you're well. the cop, like two days away from retirement. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. And then he did it. And of no. course, we need to talk about the fact that Lorca clearly sabotaged that jump. Yeah. Because that was, he overrode something on his little pad there. And I guess he knew that if Stamets was only going to do one more jump, he was going to make it a good jump. Yeah. And so I guess now's a good time to go into the yeah. fact that Discovery was something of a finale. Uh, this mm -hmm. is sort of... The, the, the writers and producers have gone on record saying that this first batch of Discovery is, is cut into three chunks. There's the sort of prologue, which was our Vulcan Hello, Battle of the Binary Star. That was a, uh, a section of its own. Then there's these seven episodes that we've seen since then on the Discovery that is chapter one. And so ending chapter one with this mystery jump into somewhere uh, begs a lot of questions. Uh, Heath, what were your main questions when you were looking at this last moment of this episode? Well, I was seeing him put it together because he shows, he shows the map of all the jumps and stuff like that and how they're piecing together in the universe behind the universe and then uh, 133 jumps... What's that going to do to this map that he's got? I felt from it that it, he now has enough information to make this jump. I I was questioning, like, is Lorca from the Mirror Universe and somehow he ended up in this one and he's trying to get back? Or does is there something going on in the Mirror Universe and that's why he wants to go? So it, I ended up with like a lot of like plot questions about where it's going now. Yeah. Yeah. Cat, um, what about you? Um... I was really caught up in in the concept of of there's a lot of like full circles going on throughout that entire episode of just like her ending back on the Klingon ship from which mm -hmm. she started in the in the first couple episodes and then also if if uh, Lieutenant Tyler is Vok like we think he is mm -hmm. him being back again on the t again yeah. so it's these kind of interesting sort of um, things so m my question was where was where where what where were we or where is Lorca taking us that he has been somewhere before and that was sort of similar it mm -hmm. kind of feeds into that because it felt very natural for him to sort of it did look like he knew exactly where he was going he was building a map there were already points there he knew he he knew already almost too much information when he was sharing that with us it, it really begs a question because Lorca had some wonder in this episode. And it's the first time it wasn't like battle-hardened, brutal general, and it was like a, a, a discoverer. Someone who wanted to go learn something and go on an adventure. And it really begs a question, is he adventuring to somewhere he's been before? Or is he, uh, is he just genuinely curious? I just had a weird epiphany, guys. So 
how's this? Okay, how is it that at the beginning he was super protective of Burnham? He didn't want her to go. So maybe we should be asking also where and when has he been? It, that is another neat question. Weird, right? Is this a time travel thing? Is this a universe traveling thing? Mm-hmm. Is the mirror universe too simple of an answer? Are we, as Discovery, as the Discovery series, are we even in the prime timeline and the prime timeline's reality? Because people have been asking, oh man, if this is supposed to be the prime timeline, it doesn't look right. Well, we've been talking about two different bifurcating times. There's the Kelvin verse that JJ made, and then there's the one that Gene Roddenberry created and we've been staying on this whole time. Mm -hmm. And then there's, of course, underneath it, there's the mirror universe. And it begs the question, how many more underneath that can we go? And is Discovery in one of these? And that's why it looks absolutely nothing like it should. Crisis on the infinite earth. Right? Is it a crisis on infinite earth kind of thing? Computer? Uh, Sam Gerard says, uh, Lorca is a devious man, but still sexy. (laughs) (laughs) Fair. It's a fair statement, Sam. Yep. And Jeff Kelly, uh, wanted to point out that Tilly spilling the beans on the side effects means she should be called Cadet Spilly. Cadet Spilly. Oh, that's so good. I love that. Yeah, I love that. I think Lorca knew that if he headed to the Starbase, the ship was gone. Yeah, he has Cornwall in his ship. There's no metal waiting for him. Anything like that, and it's like, uh, well, I'm not going going back. Yeah, I, I definitely think it was it was a man deciding to take his ship AWOL, because you're right. Cornwall, yeah. as soon as they got her back, it's like, oh, well, okay. now she's going to strip the ship away from me. Mm-hmm. He's going to lose everything. And so where and when did he decide to take everyone? There's They can't tell where they are, which means... This idea that the the mycelial network connects across galaxies, plural, means it is possible they're just, like, in the Andromeda galaxy. Like, they have gone so far that they can't figure out where they are because they don't chart other galaxies yet. Can we talk a little bit also about what's going on with Stamets and what we think is going to happen? Because the one thing that popped into my head, and I know it's not your favorite um, series, okay, but the only thing kept on coming to me was, you know, Stamets going possibly... I'm, I don't know, blindish? Ha- blindish or having his vision augmented mm-hmm. in that way. And like him Charlie X. Being so super fair and then one and then the blue crystal and all the thing. I was like, oh my God, Enar. The d- Andromeda, the blind Andromeda oh, species yeah. that and pilots. And oh, and sorry, Andromeda. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. Oh my God, see, look. Oh, now, yes. now, now, now it's I, Dan. To be now fair, I down. said Andromeda first. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Andorian. Look at you, you're so mean. <laughs> Still gonna crush him. Anyways, yeah, that <laughs> popped into my head. I was wondering what you know, where you know, I don't know if that could. Well, really now the Anar were or, the, but that would have been technically. But they're just like after, so I don't know. hyper. There were telepaths. Right? Yeah, yes, telepathic they were. and Dorians that the also Romulans albinos. were using to control control the ship. ships. But if you go to Voyager, when Tom right. Paris achieves the theoretical warp ten, he's like, I was everywhere at once. Right, right. The amount of information, and it's interesting the line that he has when they pull him out, and it's like. I can see them all. I think was, was I can see mind. them all. Like that, I can yeah. see it all. Like yeah, 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 and the, yeah. It's really interesting. I wonder, and also though, it does sound very much like the the pav 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 the pavins pavins the pavins. Yes, with their the, the ability to sort of see everything at the same time, coexisting. Or, yeah, it was strange yeah. that this episode, even though it was like a two parter, orbiting the same planet, that it didn't actually factor in. Yeah. The Pavins had, like, nothing to do with this except that everyone was planning on coming back to solve this problem. And there was a moment when, you know, Saru was like, oh, we should really totally solve this problem because I really care about them. And it's like, yeah, don't worry. That would have happened either way. So it was interesting that they wound up using this as the the location for the battle. It was really just handy that the mm-hmm. Pavins were like, you guys should totally get together and have a nice chat. The and then like, they decided to just wipe each other out instead. Yeah. And maybe, and it's funny because we actually mentioned that last week, right? You were saying, well, what are the Pavins? Do, do they have good intentions? What are their intentions? Yeah. Is this like Day of the Dove or is this, right. you know, it's like how do these mysterious non-corporeal aliens want to solve this problem? And we still don't know. We don't. It could have been, let's bring them together for a fight. But we just totally dropped that narrative ball. And now that the show is in a different uh, reality time, we don't really know, uh, I don't really feel like we're going to go back to that anytime soon. No. 
Well, See do you think it, there's more <laughs> answers now after after this episode in terms of like who is this Klingon that's in the brig? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. The first Star Trek. I guess sex scene. It seems to be the first Ooh. love scene, and it was yeah. an interspecies species. love scene, which Slash is interesting. Klingon breasts. Species. I said it. It's out there. Yeah. Klingon breasts. Or were they or were from they? species? Because That's you're right. Very, very, very alien. We very, were talking yes. about the design of this love scene uh, off camera beforehand, and it really did, especially with the way it was heavily lit. It felt like an inversion of the black colored design. It was very Geiger mm-hmm. uh, in the Natasha Henstridge uh, species films. And it's interesting that they decided to show that much of a Klingon body naked. I mean, we've seen Worf's back and it just looked like Michael Dorn's back with some bumps down the middle. Um, but, you know, along with the rest of the Klingon redesign, like, it's all different. It's all different stuff. Yeah. Many of them things. And it, and it begs a question, uh, in that love scene between Laurel and Tyler, do we think those are Tyler's memories of being raped in prison, or are they Vox memories of his relationship with Laurel? I think that they did a good job just with like the flashbacks of, is it torture? Is it a surgery? Mm-hmm. What is it? Are, were they lovers? Is it the like, husband and wife thing? Are they not? It did a good job of casting doubt into, like, what actually is he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then his story was really good, too, about, yeah. you know, seven months in prison. Like, what do you do? It's like, you know, I gave her what I would like. It made it sound like he taunted her because he didn't want to die. So he's like, bring it on. Torch me. I'm not going to give you anything. Oh, is that all you got type of thing? Yeah. yeah. And it was like, all these other people have died. I'm still alive. So I guess I did the right thing was an interesting question for him to ask. Yeah. The, the survival-based ethic. And then also just boldly exploring the, the PTSD, which was really, mm-hmm. really the first time, I think, across any any Star Trek that term has been, I guess, explored in, in that context. I don't know. For certainly me, I, I this, was like, has anyone ever actually talked about PTSD before? And that certainly in this way. I yes, mean, we was, there was some... Uh, there was an element of it before it was even a term, I think, in the menagerie. Right. Because, you know, well, every Pike had, had a different term. But it, was, yeah. but it was just interesting. It's in our terms and in mm-hmm. our mental health terms. For me, I was like, what? Oh, this is really interesting. What's happening? And then to know, and then I thought it was kind of a cool thing that the Admiral sort of like talked him down and mm-hmm. sort of brought him back into life. In, into you know and and that he remembered Burnham and that little and that kiss and yeah. that you know that that was kind of interesting to see what his sort of grounding point was um, but really I think this like Tyler is all about this is the my favorite part of this episode is Tyler is the whole is he Vok is he not what's going on you know what, and now that they have Laurel in the bridge what's going to happen in the second half and the duality of everything he says and everything that is said to him including mm-hmm. Burnham saying you've put on this facade you know and yeah. I'm like getting goosebumps because I don't know what's going to happen and I don't know how it's going to be revealed but even that talk about the torture and, and everything it's like you know I mean he was tortured by his own species he was tortured by, by, by Laurel in different ways, in, in, in terms of betrayal. And we don't know. We just don't know what this is leading to. And I was, I was really excited. Yeah. And I, do, I agree very much that they did a great, great job with that Keeping editing. That and a, like, as ambiguous as possible. Yeah, and just the, ooh, it was creepy, some of what he was remembering. And, and yeah, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't know if we were seeing him being changed, if we were seeing him being yeah. physically augmented into Surgery human. or torture. It's a right. really good line to walk. Mm-hmm. Well, it's almost shades of Homeland. Yeah. Where hero soldier comes back and he's been pre-programmed to do certain things. And then, I won't let them hurt you. Right. And her, and then him saying, what did you do to me? Like that, I mean. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be great to see where that goes because now they're, if they've gone to a different reality or a different time, there is no Klingon Empire or Starfleet to bring this, to bring this particular war criminal to. Right. So she's just in the bridge. And so there's going to be some very interesting conversations, I think, between all of the people involved in this. Cornwall's going to make a full recovery when she gets to a med bay. She's not going to a med bay anytime soon because she's just on the ship. Right. So we might have a bit of an admiral in a chair. 
we right, may have a bit of a menagerie pipe, pipe yeah, kind yeah, of vibe. Yeah, so exactly. that'll be that'd be interesting. <laughs> They give her a light. I can talk. Hey, why use do I have the to... light? Oh, you can only use the light. <laughs> um, the one thing I found was really interesting too is when Cole, before he with with uh, Georgia's um, yeah yeah his toothpick yes his toothpick but that he puts it on yeah he chooses to put it on and I thought that that with everything going on with Tyler and the questions of you know who is he and everything whoa I was like. <sighs> Hang on, wearing Starfleet badge. Oh boy, yeah. computer. Uh, Derek is mentioning that uh, in uh, Deep Space Nine, Nog suffered from PTSD yep. when he lost his leg. Yeah. Oh Absolutely. yes, that's he right. That's right. That was a really good it. episode. That yeah. Was, um, that was. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, and Picard. Uh, after, after the Borg. Borg. After Borg. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, going home and yeah. having his sort of come down from that. Although, the PTSD of him and the Borg doesn't really factor in again until uh, First Contact. When he goes back into those... Even when, when yeah. in I, Borg, when they were dealing with Hugh, it felt like he was like a little off-put by it. But right. it was never like full-on PTSD. In, in the feature, they really allowed that... Uh, psychological condition to factor into oh no what's Picard gonna do and it's probably the only time they had something resembling an excuse for him to be John McClane from Die Hard like yeah. <laughs> that's not Picard but in this sort of Moby Dick grudge match that they they had him be that mad Captain Ahab in First Contact PTSD could have factored into that I feel like it was interesting I've heard some people complaining about how when uh, Tyler shot at Laurel on the prison ship. Mm -hmm. He seemed totally fine, and then when he finds her in that uh, on the, on the ship of the dead, his PTSD kicks in. But um, there was somebody that I was in a conversation with online that was a psychiatrist and specifically said, um, when the trauma is fresh, it is a very different kind of reaction you have to that. But after he's had a chance to reintegrate into Starfleet, that's when post-traumatic stress syndrome would actually kick in. So I found that quite interesting and accurate in the show. And we also don't know if that shooting at Laurel on the prison ship was part of a plan. We don't know how... It's starting to feel far... less and less like it was part of a plan. It's mm. starting yeah. to feel like it might have been a pre-programmed action, mm. but not so much Ash's acting, right. you know? It, it, it certainly seems like he is... He's a sleeper. He's a Manchurian candidate, basically. He's yeah. one of those sleeper agents who has no idea what's happened. And I think that's a cool place for him to be because we get to watch him genuinely disturbed by it and not just acting disturbed. And we also really... I, I like seeing him interact with the crew. I love the trust that we have. I like him. I want to see more, you know, of, of what happens with him and Burnham and, and how they, how, what happens if she, you know, if the war is over. Oh, that's the other interesting thing, too. Lorca's a sly fox because if he moves the ship, then she stays with him because yep. she can't go back to prison. That's the thing. The The whole idea win, win, win. of this going to a different dimension means everybody gets to stay where they are. We don't necessarily find out that Ash is a Klingon. Right. We don't get Cornwall able to take away a ship unless a mutiny happens. Right. We don't get Burnham going back to prison. And, I mean, that idea that the, the war isn't over, but killing Call means at least... Uh, some conversation could be had. Maybe some peace can be brokered. Yeah. And it was interesting that we destroyed the Ship of the Dead in this episode. Because, I, yeah. I mean, it was a cool ship, I guess. It was a weird <laughs> ship. I mean, this whole idea that Klingons have cloaking technology before making their deal with the Romulans never really sat well with me. Yeah. But, you know, and then it proliferating throughout the Klingon fleet... Um, it's all way, not way too early, but like seven to ten years too early for any of this to be happening. So it's a whole other reason that I feel like if they say they're in another universe entirely and that the entire show, the first uh, nine episodes of Discovery happened in a whole other mirror, mirror universe, then that's the only way I can see the... Writers who have said, don't worry, the canon problems will all work themselves out in the end. It's like, if you're in another universe, you, 100%, 
this redesign, this all totally works. This idea that there's a whole other Vulcan who's already an admiral at Starfleet because Spock was supposed to be the first yeah, Vulcan. Like, actually... There's a lot of stuff that's broken on Discovery from a narrative perspective as well as a visual perspective. Well, didn't Paul she resigned her commission in the Vulcan High Command and was given a commission in Starfleet? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that breaks yeah. that Spock yeah. was the first. Um, but it's interesting that we're seeing another one on purpose right. that's causing this. Because, you know, maybe what T'Pol had because she didn't go through the academy yeah. made her, like, not technically an academy graduate. I don't know. Um, and maybe the same thing happens with uh, this Vulcan admiral we've been we've been dealing with. But it's just, like, finding these, and it only happens with prequels when this is a problem, finding these, like, weird loopholes to be like, yeah, sure, Spock was that, but somehow uh, mm-hmm. she's this. Yeah. and. Yeah, the the I'm still feeling the fitting in as a prequel pains episode by episode. There's something on Discovery that as a 25 years of watching Star Trek live, um, it certain stuff just doesn't sit with me. The narr- the narrative elements are really great on their own. And then I go back to but does it fit within the universe that is called Star Trek because the Expanse is allowed to do whatever it wants because it's called the Expanse and so was Firefly and so was Battlestar Galactica but this is called Star Trek Discovery and so I keep going back to the fact that it needs to fit within the Star Trek universe and that's not easy there's 700 hours of Star Trek there's a lot to fit into you know I did feel though I did feel though today as Lorca was feeling a little protective of Burnham and Tyler, and they were talking about an away mission, I did feel the stirrings of uh, of Kirk Bones and Spock. I can't, I can't help it. I yeah, could. You I, I, I that. sort of I went, didn't feel that. All right, he didn't feel it. Whatever. No, but I just, wrong. just hey, <laughs> no. Look, they're totally not the same people. I get that. But it was just that one moment. One moment. You know. What did you think of the fight choreography? I thought the fight choreography was kind of weak. Yeah, me too. And maybe it wasn't the choreography. Maybe it was just trying to use actor action because there's a trick when you're doing fil- when you're filming a fight scene. There are elements where you can have a stunt person doing it and elements where you can have the actual actor doing it, and that's called actor action. And so when you have a stunt person doing it in makeup to look like call, no one's really going to notice, especially in like a medium shot. But if it's not if it's not Burnham, you're going to know. Right. So they tried as much as possible to use Burnham. And I feel like Sonica was like, she had the moves, but it's TV. So it's a little harder to get it. Like, these are the three months we spent in rehearsal for this fight scene. So ah, I think it, the thing it, it didn't work slow, for me. Like very like his punches were... Yeah, coming it was down like that. And it was like it looked iron like he fist gave her slow. a pair of gardening shears to fight with. Yeah. And like, <laughs> As it was happening, Sonia and I were watching this episode together, and it was like, why is this not a Batleth fight? I know you've redesigned I, the Batleth, but I, bring it on, man. I wanted to see that, too. And I think that that would have been more uh, honorable in a weird way, and it would have been way more cool to see her fighting with the Batleth, but hey. And it's not like Call is a particularly honorable Klingon. He's no. like a Romulan Klingon. Yeah. He's, he, he's just betraying on every side. And I think Call, like, murdering Call... He's like the second most important current Klingon well, that we're supposed to care about. Didn't they talk about the Duras family at some point in the series, or am I trying to interject are you, that? Are you because trying to like, you're, are you trying the, to make peace with it? it <laughs> the, to... the Duras, or so he had some. I wonder. It's notoriously it feels known familiar now. The, through his like you know, a betrayer yeah, family. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wonder if he's a Duras. That would make sense. That would. And I feel like there's um, there's an element to call that because he only had so many episodes and he only had so many moments and he only spoke English for like five minutes. But it was, a good it was five ki- minutes. It was a solid yeah. five minutes. That Universal Translator goes a long way. Apparently it's not in our TVs like Gene Roddenberry said. It's in Michael Burnham's hand. Yeah. There we go. And I thought it was also interesting that the... The device was in her hand, she put it down over here, and then they fought on like the other side of this bridge that's four times the size of a regular like Starfleet bridge, and you could still hear him speaking English. It's really good like Future it's speakers. like Wi Fi. It's speakers. like yeah. really, really yeah. good. They had a single surround. booster. Yeah. 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 So good nice. surround. Good surround sound. <laughs> so let's get back to the Orville for a moment and talk about the sort of narrative structure of the episode. Because we did have a serious like journey to Babel story happening mm-hmm. here where there's several groups on two sides of a story and they're trying to figure out which side of the story they're going to go with. And the idea that 
you know, Rob Lowe's character finds a, a common ancestor. It's like the the pinnacle of you've got no choice but to compromise. Oh, you knew that was right. going to happen at the very beginning. Right? They were going to find a common ancestor. It was yeah. just so telegraphed. Do you agree? I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know... I, I, I mean... From the, yeah, pretty much from the beginning. Mm. Pretty much. I mean, ultimately, it's the B story to the Kelly Ed love story with Dar. And, like, almost the C story to the fact that there's also the Finn, uh, the Finn and Yafet story. And I felt like a really cool, like, space diplomacy storyline kind of got thrown under the bus for... The silliness. The, the silliness. Stuff. And, and maybe... The only positive element I think that can come from this odd story choice and character choice for the Orville is that the best episodes of the Orville and the best moments seem to have Ed and Kelly working together. And so it kind of felt like they were past the the Derulio and the the whole problems of the first episode were behind them and they were professionals and friends. Yeah. Well, and now they can, like put this other element behind them in a whole other way. So maybe we'll now get to see them try in earnest to be the mom and dad of the ship and be together. I was maybe just, that comes yeah, out. Yeah, I was hoping so much to see at least a conversation to that effect at the end. Do you know what I mean? Just something like, it besides felt, the, oh, it was just pheromones that a year ago, Or too. was it, hmm, Or yeah. was it, It felt like know. it was an earlier episode, like yes. almost yeah. as if this one was supposed to be like the fourth episode of the season. And then they and were they like, oh, you know, this is what, maybe they looked at what Discovery was doing. It's like, let's move these ones up because mm. these are these are gold. And then what do we, what do, we do with number four? Up, put it in nine. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. I mean, tape yeah. that's the thing about something that's as episodic as this. There are very few elements that are serialized, but certainly the, um, the idea that Derulio was a choice of, of Kelly's and now that it was not a choice of Kelly's, it'll be interesting to see if, from a serialized perspective next week, we see whether, oh, we're, uh, we're in this strange new world where it wasn't exactly her to blame for well, her I choice. I think that was the great choice of Rob Lowe. And in that moment, he says, maybe. And just look on his face, it's so 50-50. Like, is he saying this because... He's been with both of them, and he understands the relationship. And he doesn't want to hurt them. Understands I hurt them, and, like, look at these warring people. What can I do to help? And he's like, I'll say maybe, because maybe, maybe bring the two of them back answer. together. But that it could also be that angle. it had nothing to do with it. That is an interesting angle. Well, now that we've had a good chance to discuss each episode, shall we uh, switch it to a red alert there? <sighs> we'll go to tactical alert. <sighs> now, here's the thing. <laughs> we are about to go into our last... Uh, comparison of of Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Orville. <laughs> and so I'm thinking you are what's going to help us decide how much more of this we're going to do. Um, next week there's an Orville episode and if you'd like us to review it, let us know. Uh, we can bring this together and just talk about Orville or if you're just interested in Discovery, let us know. We can just, like, relax and watch the Orville and not review it. And then in January, we can come together and start reviewing Discovery. So we'd love to hear in the comments, both on Facebook and on YouTube, and in the forums on highball.tv. Let us know what you think. What do you want us to do? We're here for you. Um, or if you'd like to see Orville versus Voltron, <laughs> we're right in with that. There's plenty of other Different. stuff to compare the Orville to. <laughs> the Orville versus The Good Place. You know, we'll figure it out. There's a wonderful Japanese sci-fi show. I was telling everybody else, Mitsuhaya Koehaya. Uh, we could juxtaposition those together. I'm sure it all fits perfectly. But now let's talk about whether the Orville or Discovery made, like, proper Gene Roddenberry aspirational re-examine-your-life Star Trek this week. Kat, what do you think about the Orville? Trekked it or wrecked it? Wrecked it. Yeah? Yeah, sorry, I had to <coughs> actually say that out loud about the Orville, and I haven't actually... I don't think I've said that about the Orville yet this, this season, but, yeah, I think, um... I think it has a ways to go. It hit some notes. It made some cute. It did make me think, uh, you know, again, naked time, naked, you know, whatever. But I just, I, I, 
it it really really put the female characters into some strange situations for me i feel like the decisions and the character you know just development took a turn i don't i feel like if roddenberry had a message it would have been lost um yeah and it was a cute laugh but that's not enough for me to track it Fair. Heath, yeah. what about you for the Orville? Trek it or wreck it? Well, I'd love to disagree with Kat because it creates conflict in our relationship. <laughs> but um, I gotta agree. It, it was a wreck it. I enjoyed it. It was a fun episode. But it... Put it this way. If you were going through your queue on Netflix watching the Orville and you had just watched this one and this one popped up, it would be one that you would skip. <gasps> to go on to skip it. Another a one. New... To go watch episode ten instead. Yeah, to go watch episode ten instead. <laughs> cool. So All that right. that's how this one feels. Now Star Trek Discovery. Trek it or wreck it? It's a, this was a really interesting one because I'm always whenever they deal with a cloak ship, I'm like, can't you put like some you know, <laughs> spray paint on a torpedo so when it hits, it leaves Just a little paintball, spray. man. Exactly. How hard is that? Or like in a radioactive isotope. They talk about that all the time. Just something there. So I think it did trek it for me, but just barely. Okay. Just barely. What about you, Kat? <sighs> Discovery. This is really trek it, interesting wreck it. because I really enjoyed it. And again, I'm finding it like enjoying something is not necessarily trekking it. No, not at all. Just say. That's fair. They, to, to be totally clear, we're just talking about whether this is like Gene Roddenberry aspirational trek, not whether we liked it or not. Because it's either, anyway you slice it, it's two hours that you're in a Star Trekish universe. And mm -hmm. it's an enjoyable thing to do most times. I really loved it. I loved this episode very, very much. Um, I thought that, again, just with the, 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 the questions it was making me ask and um, where it was taking my, my like, the, the view for the future was like, holy crap, you know, what's going to happen next? I just, I don't know if it necessarily trekked it. I don't know if it did. I'm going to actually say it was an amazing finale. It was fantastic. Was it Gene Roddenberry? No, I don't think it was. I think it stands alone. It did not trek it for me. It wrecked it. However, I'm going to say that in the most positive way possible. Still a good episode. It was an amazing episode. I freaking loved it. I cannot wait for next yeah, season. Good yeah, good sci-fi is not necessarily good Star Trek. Good Star Trek is a subset of that. Right. So... Going into whether I thought the Orville trekked it or wrecked it, I think it just straight up wrecked it. I think we were dealing with issues of consent really in a tone-deaf manner. This was a really great opportunity to talk about that. And sure, Seth MacFarlane didn't know that we'd be in the middle of this huge Hollywood Me Too upheaval of consent. But, uh, shit, man. I don't know that this episode would have been well-timed ever. Yeah. But it was so not well-timed now. And so, for me, it is the antithesis of topical, because it took the, the conversation in the wrong direction. So I think Orville straight up wrecked it. I enjoyed the episode. I laughed. There were moments where I was too hyper-aware of the consent issue happening and the undermining of Finn's character, and I was just like, nah, this episode's not doing it for me. I'd skip it. If I had episode 10 to get to, I would watch that mm -hmm. instead. And as for Star Trek... Um, the thing for me was that I've seen the Picard maneuver before. I didn't need to see him. I didn't need to see Stamets pop it around as often as as it did. But it was you know it was there, um, and I just really got to the point when I was watching this episode that I was just taken aback by how many things didn't feel like it fit in the Star Trek universe, and I, this episode wrecked it for me. I enjoyed watching it, but I spent easily 40% of it talking to Sonya about things that I thought didn't work. Um, they both wrecked it for me. This is like a, a zero out of six, everybody wrecked it week. No. 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 Oh, no. Ha, ha, I was at like 49, like 49 51. Okay. So it's like, it. it's like, a, so almost like barely a barely trek. there. This is barely like the there. lowest trek. This is. Of, uh, this is the lowest trek anyone's. Although we all yeah. enjoyed this, I, didn't we? I loved we it. I Don't get me wrong. I loved it. But did it trek it? No. No. All right. Computer. 
Uh, well, we have uh, three people, Jason, ah. Anya, and Derek. Okay. Saying that Discovery tracked it. Okay. And the Orville wrecked it. All right. Yeah. So that is unanimous. Of, of three yeah. online Trekkies and three Trekkies in the chair, Orville. we're all saying the Orville wrecked it. Online but, agreed with me. Yeah, and online is agreeing with you. So it's like Discovery is like coming <laughs> out of the coming out of the this lump, this like bad slump it was in at the beginning. And I feel like, you know, what they do with the back half of the season could be great or it could be more like innocuous science fiction. And I would love it if we continue to examine things a little more carefully. Like having a character with PTSD is not a, really an examination of our world and taking something that we take for granted and Rubik's cubing it and handing it to us with a new way to look at it. It's just a character with PTSD. So I'd like to see Star Trek get smarter and go into that place where they are using the science fiction lens to tell a story about us instead of just doing stuff we do in space. Um, I think there's a fine line there and Gene Roddenberry often, not always, but often achieved the right side of that line. And with the Orville, like, just don't be so tone deaf. Don't be... Just don't... grow up. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, like, <laughs> keep being Would you have felt it was funny. as tone deaf if they just took out the whole doctor sex thing? Like, they still could have no, done, like, I don't the, think that was the, thing that the advances, and then the others, whoa, what, what is this? It, He's taken aback by it, it really... and it's just the it... captain? For me, it was that nobody ever said, listen, Derulio, this thing in your in your society that it's rude to turn down sex, mm -hmm. it is very different when your pheromones are making people do things against their will. You need to discuss consent with people, and you need to only maybe do this when you're not giving people quaaludes with your squirty head. Like, that to me was where the... That's where the conversation about today could have been so beautifully used through a science fiction lens, mm -hmm. and they missed the opportunity. And the fact that he knew about it the entire time yep. and was hiding it really bothered me as well. It bothered me to no end. I just, it, I, I thought that he'd be like, oh, or some kind, because he was sort of portrayed in this Actually, really sweet way. Matt, having just said that, oh. it's really interesting because now it feels like to me like this was an episode out of place. Like maybe this one was supposed to come a little bit earlier. Maybe. And because of what's happening in Hollywood they're like oh shit they're like we gotta release it sometime oh they should have buried it well Ugh. yeah cause now they're just or villains oh, oh. <laughs> I had to see so what I lived with see fair. what I lived with <laughs> Well, next week there's a new episode of the Orville. Uh, next week we're just gonna like think about Discovery a bit, I guess. I might. Uh, I think I'm gonna be canceling my CBS All Access subscription because I have no need to pay yes, for it for two us months. Yes, us too. We were <laughs> right and happy with it at all. Watching well, on the funny thing is, I do. I can just use like my mother-in-law's login for Bell Crave uh, if I want to watch any Discovery episodes after the fact. Because the thing about Crave is that they're only available on Monday which is a day too late for that to matter. So I d Crave was of no use to me until now, where I could actually like review episodes, Isn't binge them, see what I think about space it. Space or Pretty something cool. like that too? Space, yeah, Space I think space has its has own... Space has a subscription that you can actually, yeah, so you can do that. And it's the um, day after? It's on Monday? I believe it's actually the same day. The day I'm of. not sure, I, but, but I'm not 100%. And Interesting. I know Orville, you can watch on City TV, you can watch the, um, the, the next the morning. Next. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so, yeah, the, the yeah, the full streaming episode. But you know, we could you, you, we could still talk about so the Orville the um, through the Gene Roddenberry filter. We could still have the same Trekkie Direct That's discussions. True. So if you're interested in having our panel of Trekkies back on a weekly basis for the next four episodes of the Orville, let us know in the comments. We've got YouTube comments we check out. We've got Facebook comments we keep an eye on. And there's the forums on highballtv.com. So hop online, watch the episodes, talk to us. Let us know what you thought about the episodes because that is half the fun. And maybe next week we will uh, see you guys again. <gasps> we'll see. You guys let us know.